My name is Donald M. Ware. I was born in Richmond, Virginia, raised in Arlington. I uh, attended Duke University. I got a first degree in mechanical engineer in 1957 and commissioned in the Air Force the same day through the ROTC program. I didn't know whether I wanted to be an engineer or, or an Air Force officer, so I took a one-year delayed active duty and went to North American Aviation for 10 months. Decided I'd rather fly the airplane instead of work on it. I was working on F-100 flight test program heat and vent system. And so I kind of lucked out when I got into pilot training because, because uh, I put my name in the pot for 100s and we only had we only had three 100 slots in the class and I got one of them. So uh, after 10 years of flying fighters, I, uh, they were gonna convert me to F-111. This pin, this rather strange pin that I wear is probably uh, describes one of the most important things going on on this planet right now. I think these, these little guys are zeta reticulans that uh, many, many of the abductees, UFO abductees, see in their, their secret nightlife, if you want to call it that. And I'm absolutely convinced from everything I've seen over the past 52 years that there's a long-term program to upgrade our biological computer. Anybody that knows anything about computers knows you have to upgrade your computer every now and then. I think we're getting a bigger hard drive, a faster chip, and a new USB port for telepathy. And let me show you what I think you get when you combine the genes of these two species. I think this is, although not named by Time Magazine, but this is Homo alterios spatialis, higher human from space. And these are our offspring, our children that are, have to be hidden from us until the consciousness of our neighbors changes and was willing to accept them. This picture was shown to millions and millions of people on ABC. They didn't say anything about it, but they put this picture into the consciousness of Americans, at least, and eventually the world, I think, one more time. You know you have to be somebody special to get your face on the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> this is a promo issue, 23 June 1997, for the Roswell 50th anniversary, Roswell crash, 50th anniversary. Certainly there is a cover-up, and all UFO researchers recognize that Project Blue Book, the most public cover-up, was, uh, was just the government's public relations agency. They did announce to the world they wanted to know about our UFO sightings and stuff, but the cases that were really worthwhile and could not be explained away by some natural or man-made object were not investigated by Blue Book, they were passed on to the real investigators. And I'm convinced that, that the U.S. or the Office of Naval Intelligence was the office of primary responsibility for, for ground, or you might say ground activities associated with the alien presence. And the reason is because their bases were in Navy territory not in Air Force territory. Although we'd see them more in the air, these things could come and go from the air down through the water, no problem. You le read uh, books like uh, uh, Wendell Stevens' book, uh, Contact from uh, Undersea. It's, uh, it's a very interesting story. It was 1979 when when uh, Filiberto Cardenas was picked up, pulled up a blue beam in broad daylight with three of his friends, uh, taken to a little island. This wall opens up, he gets into a little flying saucer and he goes out over the water very fast down through the water. The water didn't touch the vehicle. Ended up in a, in a garage down there where there were a bunch of flying saucers and stuff. And the head alien down there told him there were 700 working out of that base and there are lots of other bases underground and undersea. That 
That first time, I, uh, I just saw red lights that were about, about as bright as Venus would be at its brightest, maybe a minus 4.5 magnitude. But they were wandering around in random motion, and uh, obviously not aircraft or celestial objects. And my thought was, gee, is this what I read about last Sunday morning in the newspaper? Because the Washington Star had flying saucers in the headlines. And so nothing more was happening. So I, uh, after about 10 minutes of watching, so I went on to bed. It was, you know, pushing midnight by then. I got up early the next morning to get the newspaper, and sure enough, again, second Sunday morning in a row, the word flying saucers was in the headlines. The aliens put on a demonstration to the extent that the, the media could not ignore it and the government couldn't cover it up. Let me get back to that earlier question. Can you imagine any president, whether it be Bush or Clinton or whatever, standing before the public and saying, yes, I am aware that we have this joint program with some aliens to upgrade our biological computers to build better bodies to house our souls in future incarnations. And we are picking up your daughters and your wives, and we're taking their eggs, we're splicing in the right genes. Some are, are a subspecies that uh, look more like us and their human mothers are allowed to raise them, but those that don't look enough like us to fit in with our society are taken at three to three and a half months. They're about that long. We put them in artificial wombs, then we pick up the, the mothers again and we take them in and allow them to hold them within their aura to nurture them. We pick up the grandmothers sometimes for the same purpose. He says, they can't talk about things like that. If, if any president made that kind of statement, then, um, you know, because they pick them up and they, they have to put it, the altered egg in there and then they pick them up again he wouldn't be able to do the job we hired him to do. The media would hound him to death. You know, it would be ridiculous. So I understand the reasons for the secrecy. I spent 26 years in the Air Force, and I know if the government has a secret they really want to keep, they don't admit they have a secret. Okay, I, I was fortunate I uh, had a chance to talk to Peter Jennings for his... Uh, ABC special, and the first question he asked me was, what caused you to be interested in this subject? When I was 16 years old, I was walking down the street in Arlington, Virginia, and saw seven red light type UFOs over Washington that uh, made headlines around the world. And since then, I have seen eight alien vehicles on eight occasions. It was that just that three seconds, alien vehicles on eight occasions that got on the ABC special. But that started me to become a truth seeker on 26 July 1952. I've read everything I could find about UFOs and the alien presence since then. At 17, I went to Duke, read a, everything in their library on the subject. Uh, American Rocket Society had the most interesting stuff. Went to the Air Force 26 years as a fighter pilot. Uh, staff scientist, teacher, program manager, got a master's in nuclear engineering, retired at age 47 with 100 percent of my time to do whatever I wanted to do and enough money to do it. So the day, day after I retired officially, I became a field investigator and state section director for MUFON for five counties in uh, western Florida. I uh, the next year became state director for Florida in 89, I was elected to be the Eastern Regional Director of MUFON, over, overseeing the investigative activities in 18 eastern states. In, uh, in uh, 93, I became a director of the International UFO Congress. Since 82, I have been attending six conferences a year on the average of many different types that involved expanding consciousness and UFOs. Things like uh, International Transpersonal Association conferences in uh, Clarney, Ireland, and uh, uh, Noetic Sciences conferences, uh, International Conferences on Science and Consciousness. And I heard about these things called State of the World Forums that um, were, were 
put on by a fellow named Jim Garrison with the State of the World Forum, who is also president of the Gorbachev Foundation USA. And uh, all the world leaders are coming and basically trying to figure out what kind of a planet we want to live on in this 21st century. And I never got an invitation. You had to get an invitation to that real select group. <laughs> I was on a birding trip in Attu Island because I'm a serious birder. And I was discussing government affairs in the evening hours when we weren't out birding with a gentleman from Point Reyes who was also interested in government affairs. And I told him about State of the World forums and he had never heard of them. It was some miracle, I think, that caused an invitation for him to attend the State of the World Forum, the sixth and last one held in New York City in conjunction with the UN Millennium Summit, to be in his mailbox. And he didn't know, want to go, and he knew I did, and he just put it in the mail and said, why don't you go in my stead? So when the, when the package got there, you filled out the registration form, and there's a place for title, and I put, I put uh, Director International UFO Congress, when I got there, uh, I was quite impressed. There were about 1,500 people trying to figure out the best ways to manage globalization so that the, the selfish didn't gobble up the meek and destroy the environment that supports us all. I got to participate in uh, uh, roundtables on democratizing world government, on uh, uh, getting more spirituality in the United Nations and that kind of thing. Um, I, I actually, when it came my turn to talk in that World Governance Conference, I, um, I, I suggested the people trying to decide how to get from where we are to a democratically elected world government ought to read three books. And I mentioned Timothy Good's book, Above Top Secret, because it describes one or two major UFO cases in many different countries and how that government reacted to it. And I said they should read Bud Hopkins' book, Witness because this is a very good description of not, not UFOs coming here and saying, Taking, take me to your leader, but UFOs coming here and taking the Secretary General of the United Nations and putting a guilt trip on him for humanity polluting the oceans. And the third book was called, uh, was actually paper 72 in the book called The Urantia Book, A Revelation for Humanity, published in 1955 on 2,096 pages. And it, the, the title of the paper was, was Government on a Neighboring Planet. And it said at the end, the reason they gave us that was because there were ideas expressed there that would be useful on our planet at this time. Well, that conference, being an attendee, allowed me to put a, a web page on the exclusive State of the World Forum website, only accessible to those people that attended the six State of the World Forums, which include most of the heads of state. And it, um, it apparently got the attention of the president, because about a year later I received a phone call from his vice president saying, uh, Jim Garrison would like to speak with you. And I said, it's, it's going to have to be this afternoon or three weeks from now, because I'm going to Thailand. And three weeks you know, later, they called at the appointed time. And, and a lovely lady named Carmen Melendres said, uh, well, unfortunately, Jim had got called out this morning, and she talked to me for about an hour about all the wild things that I, you know, the ideas I've acquired at all these conferences. And, and uh, so I started, you know, sending her emails and occasionally some of the papers that I had, had written over the many years. And, and she told me later that she was forwarding all these to Jim Garrison. And the paper's about telepathic communications and UFO phenomenon, and, and one was on uh, transformation, spiritual, physical, and political, and I'd written papers on PAS, the world government, you know, all the subjects related to the UFO phenomenon that, uh, that I'd studied one at a time and then I'd spoken on for a year and then write, written, written a paper on. And he was, he must have, not been too uh, disturbed by what I was saying because he sent me an email invitation in, I think it was May of 2003, to be one of the 150 people invited to the Brussels conference, 18 to 20 
June 93. The title of that conference was National Sovereignty and World Challenges, Choices for the World After Iraq. And, you know, I was to be, to attend as a director of the International UFO Congress, which, um, which I thought was kind of interesting when you see the titles of all those other 150 <laughs> participants. The, the conference was chaired by George Bethoen, who from 1975 to 1992 was the European chairman of the Trilateral Commission. Um, the uh, speakers were people like Air Marshal Sir Timothy Garden, who was the, the head of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, you know, the kind of uh, similar to our Council on Foreign Relations in the United States. And uh, Pat Cox, uh, the, the uh, head of the European Parliament, I guess, uh, just lots of other interesting people. Uh, President of the the uh, International Chamber of Commerce and and James Woolsey and uh, really neat folks. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, well, they were sending me background information that said, well, after World War One, we formed the, the League of Nations and that to keep peace in the world, and that didn't work. So after World War Two, we formed the United Nations, and that didn't work. Now that we've had the first two battles of World War Three meaning Afghanistan and Iraq. It's obvious the Security Council can't maintain peace in the world and, and NATO can't even maintain peace in NATO. It's time for a change. And they were talking about something called community of nations. And, that, and I, I had a prior commitment on those dates that I just could not break. As much as I wanted to go to that conference, I told him, I'm sorry, I, I just can't break the commitment. And uh, so he said, no problem. Why don't you make your input by email? So I did. And I was really, I felt honored when after the conference he sent me a draft of the output document and asked for my comment on the draft. It, the draft title was, uh, was Integral Governance Initiative. And it outlined the, or described the, the 20 most important problems of the world. I think they decided they're so critical they don't have time to even rewrite the charter of the United Nations to to be able to effectively address those problems. So they're going to do it, you know, one problem at a time with the same technique that they used uh, on the, the Landmine Ban Treaty. You know, Lord Axworthy, the Foreign Minister of Canada with backing of the Canadian government, in not more than about two years got 140 nations to sign that treaty. So I'm excited about the works that State of the World Forum is now working on to address the problems of the world. The aspects I'm going to add is the presidential involvement in, in the Roswell thing. And uh, the first president I'm going to talk about is Harry Truman and his involvement. And I've spent a number of years trying to track uh, where, where Truman was at the time, where, uh, how he knew, what, all this sort of stuff. And very little because the presidential records weren't kept the same as they are now. There's a lot of blank spots, a lot of stuff wasn't recorded. And it basically, when I came to this convention, I lear learned a lot of stuff that I really hadn't known yet about the, the timelines uh, following the generals. And the one story I've sort of added, which is I think sort of a critical story, is the fact that uh, there was a number of people, Roswell witnesses, who were claimed that they were sworn to secrecy by the president. So what I'd do with each of those, I'd take the name of the person and I would check it against the presidential record. And with the presidential record, if you've met with the president, if you've spoken with the president on the phone, or if you've corresponded with the president, that's all recorded. You can take your name and you can see how many times this person, and none of these people were really checking. Then what happened was uh, a reporter out of Florida who does the UFO stories, Billy Cox, did a story about uh, Ben Games. And Ben Games was a guy who had a PhD, uh, was a major in the Air Force, uh, very prominent type guy had come forward and told him a story that he had flown in uh, General Craigie, who was uh, a development of all the new aircraft in that time uh, out of Wright-Patterson, and he claimed that he had flown Craigie into Roswell at, at that particular time when this was going on, and that Craigie had got into one of Blanchard's uh, cars 
and had taken off and said, make yourself scarce. I'm going to be busy and really didn't tell what was going on. So games went to the uh, officer's mess, heard the story of people telling about the, this crash that had just taken place and bodies and this sort of stuff. And uh, so when Craig comes back a number of hours later, he uh, said, well, fly me to Bowling Air Force Base. He's going to meet with the president. And according to Games, uh, Craigie never told him what had happened, what he had been involved with, but his boss was, was uh, General LeMay. And there was always rumors that General LeMay had actually maybe had been at Roswell, was very involved in this whole thing. So anyway, he, uh, when, when I got this, then I was really curious. Like, all these people are being sworn to secrecy by the president, but the presidential record really didn't show any involvement by the president. They had shown that the president had been asked a UFO question, and there's only two presidents who have actually been asked a UFO question in a news conference, and one of them occurred two days after the Roswell news release on July the 10th. And the problem was they asked the wrong question. They asked him, uh, have you got any insights? And he said, only what I read in the newspaper, and the press dropped it. So when I, I, I wanted to find out, so what I did is I cr contacted Tom Carey, who is one of the people on the, the latest Roswell book, and their research is just incredible. Uh, I saw their lecture yesterday, and only twice in 35 years have I ever had a feeling that this thing may actually break open, that this thing may, uh, there, there may be enough evidence to actually end the cover-up. And yesterday I had that feeling. The other time I had that feeling was in 1978 when I saw Len Stringfield lecture in Dayton, Ohio when the first mentions of dead alien bodies, when he started to talk about dead alien bodies. But it, very impressive. So I, I contacted Tom Carey and I said, well, there's these witnesses who are saying that the president swore them to secrecy, but I can't find any record in the presidential library that these people ever had any contact with the president. So Tom wrote me back and said, well, it wasn't the president, it was the Secret Service that was swearing people to secrecy. So I said, well, have you got any names? So he gave me two names and I still remember I went and, and I know how to check this. I went to the presidential records and I started to check and I can still remember when I found it and it was like the shivers went up my back. It was unbelievable. It was the name they had given me was Gerald McCann, McCann M-C-C-A-N-N. Gerald McCann had been swearing to people to secrecy in Roswell at the time on behalf of the President of the United States. And sure enough, Gerald McCann was a Secret Service agent from 1944 till Truman left office. Now you, you, to find out after that whether he was with Eisenhower, you'd have to go to the Eisenhower. But it, it just was unbelievable that no witness would have been able to make up and guess a name like that. So that, that kind of, that's one of the stories I'm telling here is, is this story, uh, the Truman story, that, that you get uh, even 60 years after, you can find a lot of material that really was never around that shows that we are on the right track, that this, this, this actually did happen. The second president I talk about when I'm here uh, in connection with Roswell was Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was, was fascinated with the UFO subject. Uh, he had, that I documented, two UFO sightings. Ronald Reagan was the type of guy who liked, he, he was an actor, he knew where to stand, he knew how to do things with backdrops and stuff like this. And if you remember, he went to the Berlin Wall to make the speech, Gorbachev tear down this wall. And when he was, uh, president, he asked Steven Spielberg to come to the White House. And in the White House uh, theater, they screened E.T. the Extraterrestrial. And one of the stories, and I, I checked this, I went to the library and got one photograph, they'd only released one photograph. Uh, during that, that, that um, screening, according to a producer by the name of Janie, Jamie Chandra, Steven Spielberg told him in Japan that near the end, Reagan had leaned over and said, I bet you there aren't six people in this whole room know how true this whole thing is. And Spielberg was shocked. And, and since then, a number of people, Billy Cox, myself, numerous people have tried to contact Spielberg to get him to confirm the story. Did Reagan tell you this? And it's only in the last year that I've got a second confirmation from, and I haven't been told of the name, but a major Hollywood producer who claims, yes, he saw my website, they went to it, and they said, yes, Steven Spielberg told me the same story. So anyway, Steven Spielberg uh, shows this movie, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. This is in June of 1982. Three months later, and the, uh, you, you'll have to remember, the Roswell book came out in 79-80 by Moore and Berlitz. So the Roswell story was pretty popular back then. And here, Ronald Reagan, three months after seeing E.T., suddenly appears at the Roswell um, uh, airport. And right in front of Hangar 84, he makes a speech. And he's, on, he's, he's speaking with... Uh, uh, Schmidt, who was the uh, Harrison Schmidt, who was uh, Apollo 17 astronaut, 
and he makes an E.T. joke. He makes a joke about E.T. at the beginning of the speech. And uh, uh, Colonel um, or Colin Powell had numerous times told stories, and he had told to a, a presidential biographer that Reagan was always trying to talk about ETs in speeches, and his job as as his security advisor was to try to keep the uh, the stuff out of the speeches. And this is this is in writing where he he said this. So Reagan makes this speech in, in front of the Hangar 84, and it's typical Reagan. He he gets it out there and uh, was fascinated. The third president I'm going to talk about here is is the most I think the most important when it comes to Roswell, and that was Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton, if he he had uh, a meeting, uh, a discussion with Paul Davids, the producer of Roswald, and Paul Davids, he told Paul Davids straight to his face, "I'm fascinated in this stuff," and his his involvement was was kind of lengthy. Uh, what had happened there was at the beginning of his administration, he he was interested, and I had given a lecture in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I had a woman come up to me at the end of the lecture, and it was one of these things where I said, can you promise to write me? She was an older lady, uh, very respectable older lady, and she said, um, I can tell you why the Clintons are interested in UFOs. And I said, well, tell me. She says, well, my sister owns the famous restaurant that the Clintons hung out in. And uh, I said, yeah. And she said, well, what happened was, and I'm not sure whether it was Bill and Hillary or somebody very close to Bill and Hillary, but when they were at the restaurant, they saw something. So Bill had this. Bill and Hillary ha had this interest in, in UFOs, and they got into the White House. And as the stories have been told, uh, they took, got Webster Hubble, who was uh, worked with Hillary Clinton in, at the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock. And he said, "If I put you over there in justice," he made him assistant attorney general. He said, "If I put you over there in justice, I want you to do two things for me: find out number one." Uh, who killed JFK because he was fascinated with JFK he, he thought he was the second JFK and he said uh, are there UFOs so he had this he had this thing started where he was trying to get the the information I had one researcher told me that he would drag admirals into the into the room and say uh, tell me what you know about UFOs and the admiral would sort of look at him like what planet are you from like I don't know what's going on and uh, so Clinton was interested and then what happened was Lawrence Rockefeller who was a, a billionaire uh, and he was sort of the Rockefeller brother who was the humanitarian. He, he was the guy who was, uh, in, he had to have philosophy degree from Princeton, was very much into uh, the ecology, he was into paranormal phenomena, this sort of stuff. And he decided whoever the next president's going to be, whether it's Bush or whether it's uh, uh, Clinton, he's going to go and get this guy to disclose. So when Clinton gets elected, Rockefeller makes his way to the, to the White House. And as he told um, uh, researchers, like Bud Hopkins, he was just going to go tell the president. And Bud Hopkins says, well, that's not how it works. You can't just go and tell the president to disclose. And what happened was he was cut off at the pass by the science advisor. They, they stuck him with the science advisor, who was John Gibbons, Dr. John Gibbons. And so he went into John Gibbons. He says, I think we need disclosure. And John Gibbons, because he's a big uh, Democrat fundraiser, you know, he's got lots of money. You can't just sort of slough this guy off. So they said, OK, well, what do you want us to do? And he said, well, it's a massive conspiracy. All this is going on, and you got to get to the bottom of this. And so Gibbons, and, and what happened was, during the Clinton administration, I filed a Freedom Information Act request with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is the Office of the Science Advisor to the President. And because one other researcher had filed, uh, Bruce McAbee, and he'd gotten 500 pages. So I said, well, I'm doing the President, so I want to see these 500 pages. So when my requests come back, I got 1,000 pages. And so this whole story of what is now called the Rockefeller Initiative is detailed in these 1,000 pages of documents. So uh, in this story is told in the documents about Rockefeller coming in and, and describing the fact that it's a massive cover-up. And Gibbons writes back to him and talks to him and says, well, if the conspiracy is as deep as you say it is and as classified as you say it is, we'll have no chance to get to the bottom of this thing. What we should do is let's just take one case, let's get that case declassified, and then we'll go after the rest of it. And so Rockefeller, I guess, thinks about it and writes back and says, yeah, okay, we'll take Roswell. And that's why in the Clinton administration, when it first started, the Clintons put out the order, and a lot of people say it was the Air Force or it was uh, through uh, Schiff, but Clinton had a lot of power to greenlight this study. So the U.S. Air Force was told out to go and reinvestigate Roswell. So they start the investigation and they go and they do their, their thing. 
And one of the things that Rockefeller had asked for was uh, clearance, or like, uh, clearance for anybody who was going to talk, that they wouldn't be prosecuted. And there is, in 1994, there was actually a, a document put out which said that anybody, a witness from Roswald, could uh, bypass their security clearances and could talk about it, and they wouldn't be prosecuted. So they, they, they get the report, a preliminary report for the Roswald study was put out in 1994. The final report was put out in late 1995. So the report comes back and Clinton gets the report. Now this we know by sort of putting pieces together. He goes to Belfast, Northern Ireland and he makes a speech and he's lighting the Christmas tree. This is November the 30th, 1995. And in this speech there's a, a, a letter writing competition in Ireland for kids to write letters to the president. Now the two kids who won the letter writing competition were sitting on the stage with Bill Clinton, but he didn't read their letter. He read a letter and I went to the Clinton Library when they released the files uh, uh, about a, two years ago and I asked where's this letter and they can't find it which makes me wonder whether the letter actually was made up by by the president and w what is important to note is anything goes into a presidential speech is there for a reason I've studied enough presidential speeches I know every single word is checked it goes uh, a State of the Union address will go through 30 different drafts every agency have to sign off on on that presidential so if it's in the speech it's there for a reason and if you see the actual clip when 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 Clinton releases this he's reading it very carefully he's reading it from a script he's not off the top of his head and what happens was they don't read the letter from the two kids who won the letter writing competition who were sitting on the stage with Clinton they read a letter from Ryan and what Clinton says is Ryan if you're out there in the audience tonight here's the answer to your question no as far as I know a UFO did not crash in Roswell New Mexico but if they did recover bodies they didn't tell me about it and I want to know now the reason he said that, and this, this clip came out and nobody really picked it up, was the first Roswell report released in 1995 didn't talk about the bodies, had no mention of the bodies. And what Clinton is doing is he's saying, I read the study and you didn't talk about the bodies. You explained to me what happened, what's with the bodies. So the Air Force goes out and does a second Roswell report and that's why there's two Roswell reports. So in 1997 they release a second Roswell report called Case Closed. And there's the one where they talk about dropping the dummies out of the plane and this the people misidentified, they got the, the, the date screwed up and that's the explanation to the body. So this report goes back and it sort of says to Clinton, here it is, here's the answer to your question, here's the answer to the bodies. And so uh, Clinton sort of just sort of gives up on it, although Rockefeller does go to the, uh, the Clintons and he, he's sort of getting frustrated. He's, he's going back and forth to the science advisor and one of the interesting things to note is he, he's always got this letter that Rockefeller's drafting and it's a letter on disclosure to the president and it basically outlines what what he wants to to get across and a number of people helped him edit the letter one was John Gibbons who's a science advisor and there's actually in the presidential file there's actually you can see the handwritten uh, notations from Gibbons on the on the columns making recommendations change this do that whatever one of the people that he'd asked for to edit it was uh, Billy Graham and Billy Graham didn't really want to get involved because he said, I've got a, you know, I've dealt with a lot of presidents and I really don't want to, I agree with your issue, but I really don't want to get into it. But the other person who helped edit the letter, and we actually have a document that, that verifies this, was Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton looked over this document. So here's Hillary Clinton, the, the uh, first lady, editing a letter on UFO disclosure to the president. And Rockefeller is getting sort of very upset. Every time he wouldn't get what he wanted, he would say, okay, I think it's time to write the letter to the president. And then they'd go, oh, no, 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 hang on. And, and they would do whatever he wanted to do. And so they tried to help him. So in 95, I guess Rockefeller gets upset. And he decides he's going to the president. He wants a meeting with the president. So the president goes to Rockefeller's ranch. And this is in 1995 before the 2006 campaign. And what happens is Clinton is seen as a sort of an elitist type guy. You know, he hangs out in Martha's Vineyard for his holidays and stuff like this. And so what they do is they agree to send him to the Rockefeller Ranch because it's backcountry Wyoming and he's going to go whitewater rafting and he's going to go camping. And Clinton said, like Dick Morris talks about, he hated it. He absolutely hated it. He didn't want to go there. He had no intention of camping and stuff like this. It just wasn't his lifestyle. But because they saw the swing voters in 1996 as being people who were techie people or people who were into the environment, he had to appeal to those people. Those would be the swing voters and that's how he had to win the election. So they sent him there and Rockefeller sits down with him and he he does a, a personal briefing. It's not a briefing but it's a, a, a citizen and he goes through a pile of material that was provided to him by Stephen Greer. Documents and stuff like this and Bill and Hillary both sit and listen to the whole thing. They really don't say anything 
And then according to Rock, what Rockefeller told Whitley Strieber, the next morning Hillary came up and said, okay, we've listened to you, don't ever bring up the subject again. And so the, the subject sort of dies out there. But uh, Clinton has talked about Rockefeller, uh, about Roswell a number of times. And a couple of times he's talked about it when the question really didn't have anything to do with, uh, with uh, UFOs. He was asked on a, on a radio talk show out of, out of Houston. And the, the more famous one is one that's just been put on the internet. And it's still not public. This was the one that we got uh, Neil Gould, who out of uh, Hong Kong, I've been trying to get this for a number of years, this uh, uh, conversation, or it was an answer to a question. He had been, I think it was to a bank, he had been doing, giving a speech to a bank in Hong Kong, and um, he had answered this, this question about uh, UFOs. And uh, I had gone to the Clinton Library, and they would sent me to the foundation, and the foundation really wasn't answering my letters, and I was trying to go. And so this thing is not public. It was sort of gotten, Neil Gould went, found somebody who was there, and they provided him a copy, but it's still not public. And in this, the, the guy asked him the question. I guess he must have been one of the powerful people who had set the thing up. And he said, well, as, as, as I have the position to do this, I'm going to ask you the question. And he said, uh, do presidents actually pass secrets from one president to another, like you and Jimmy Carter or you and Bush? Is there a, a set of secrets that get passed from one president to another? For example, where's Jimmy Hoffa's body or what happened at Roswell? And Clinton starts laughing and he starts talking about this. And he said, yes. I'll tell you, he said, in, do you remember Roswell? Do you remember the, the, the big anniversary that happened in 19, he, has an, he, he says 1998, but it was 1997. Uh, there's you know, thousands of people from all over the world came there, and people were fascinated with this. And he says, I, I'll, I'll admit, I actually tried to look into this, and I, I tried to get the documents and, and stuff. And then he starts talking about Area 51. And he doesn't mention Area 51, because they're still not supposed to use the term. But what he said was, there's a lot of people in my administration who thought that Roswell was garbage, that it, that it wasn't true. But a lot of them really believed that there was actually an alien and a, and a spaceship at this military base in Nevada. And he's talking about Area 51. So he said, I actually sent someone there to check it out. And he said uh, that we found out it was just a, a, mili a military establishment where they're doing top secret Air Force work. And then he goes again to talk about Roswell, that he really doesn't think Roswell happened, that he thinks there's uh, explanations for it. But on another, uh, a couple other occasions, it still shows that he does, he does know and he's still very interested. For example, there's the famous story about uh, Paul Davids, has had a, a long involvement with Clinton. And Paul Davids' involvement was that his father was a professor at Georgetown University and taught Bill Clinton. So what happened in 19, this would be in 19... 96, uh, Paul Davids took all the Roswell material, he took his Roswell movie and he took a bunch of uh, uh, different stuff, the Roswell book and the first Roswell book uh, uh, and he sent it to the president and he said he got an overnight letter back from the president saying thank you for the material, I didn't mention what the material was, thank you I really appreciate it, you know I liked your father and this sort of stuff, so this goes and then what happens is the Monica Lewinsky thing breaks out in late 96, 97 or whatever. And the FBI does a study. And uh, the study, uh, they, they do an investigation. And what they're doing is they're looking for a book called Vox. And this is the phone sex book that Monica Lewinsky had sent to the president. So they're looking for this book and they go to the, pre and they, they get, uh, I guess, a search uh, to go into the president's personal library inside the Oval Office. And they pull all the books and they put out the inventory of the books that were in the library. And they do find the Vox book. And the strange thing was, the book right next to the, the Vox book was UFO Crash at Roswell. So Clinton had it in his personal library. And then, uh, so what happened was, Paul Davids, this is, this is going back to just last year, Hillary Clinton's running for uh, president, and the latest Roswell book by Kerry and Schmidt is out. So he decides the president's got to read this book. I've got to him before, and he decides there's a, there's in, in the Hamptons, there's a fundraising breakfast for Hillary Clinton. And he decides, I'm going to this fundraiser, and I'm going to give this book to, Cl to, to Clinton, and I'm going to talk to him about this. So he, he doesn't know whether the Secret Service are going to stop him at the door, because he's carrying a package, of course, and security and stuff. And he said it was very strange. He walked right in, and he takes pictures of himself with Hillary in the background and to prove that he was actually there. And the, the, it was a $15 million state. And, and Paul Davis, when he told me the story, and he's told it publicly, said that they told him, he said, I, I want to speak with Clinton. And he said, okay, here's what you, what, what you do. Bill will speak first. Bill will stand up and talk. And once Bill's finished talking, 
uh, Hillary's going to come up and talk. And as soon as Hillary's finished talking, Bill will be sitting at the back along these windows. Then you go and talk to Bill because everybody's going to be going after Hillary and asking her questions, and it'll be distracted. So that's exactly what he does. He waits, Hillary finishes, the applause starts, and he goes and he sits down beside Bill Clinton. And he pulls out the Roswell material. And he puts the Roswell book in front of uh, Bill, and he says, here's the, and it had the, the cover-up. And he said, I, he can still remember Bill looking down at this Roswell book and looking at this, this subtitle about the cover-up. And he just looked up and he said, you know, I'm fascinated in this stuff, and I'm going to read this. And so we, we know he was fascinated in it, he, he, for whatever reason, and he uh, green-lighted a number of studies. The other thing that he green-lighted that a lot of people don't know is his first CIA director was James Woseley. And James Woseley, and this is according to Stephen Greer, and we're trying to check this, but James Woseley isn't talking anymore. He and his wife, who's a very high-ranking scientific person uh, in Washington, in the late 1960s had a daylight UFO sighting in Maine. Was it Maine? It was maybe on, on the East Coast there somewhere. And uh, Stephen Greer had spent three hours with the CIA director at a dinner party and had been told this and this sort of stuff. And uh, Stephen Greer is, is pressing the CIA director. Now a lot of people say it wasn't a significant meeting, Greer distorted it, whatever. And I, I personally have requested, because we have a book, I have personally requested interviews with these various people and one of them was the CIA director and I got a phone call back from somebody in the CIA office saying well very interesting project we wish you well but we're not going to do an interview so I know anybody sits down with a CIA director for three hours I don't care if you're talking about knitting or what you're talking about if you sat with a CIA director for three hours that's important so the CIA director said to him Greer said we need this release we need you to have disclosure and Wosley made a very important statement he said how can we disclose what we don't control and so Wosley puts out a request for a new CIA study. And this is in, Greer meets with him in December of 1993. And this study did come out. Now, Wosley didn't stay around very long. He, I think he left in late 94, early 95. He was only there for a couple of years. He, he resigns, but this study does come out in 1997. And it's a study on a new UFO study by the CIA and it talks about the 50 years of UFO investigations and it's the one that comes out and says that most of the UFOs people are seeing were misidentifications of U2 or SR-71s and stuff like that. So they whitewashed the study, but it was a study that was initiated by James Woseley and I think Clinton as well greenlighted this because there's a lot of different uh, people in the Clinton administration who seem to be involved and seemed to be sort of pushing different issues and different things were, were coming out. And Clinton was very interested in, in uh, openness. Uh, he did have a, an, a close association with John Podesta, who was his chief of staff. And under the Clinton administration, with John Podesta's help, they actually uh, went into an openness thing where they said um, any UFO, not any UFO document, and the rumor was that they were trying to get the UFO documents, and by pushing all the documents out, the UFO documents would come out with it. And what they said, and this is an executive order in 1995 by Clinton, that basically said to the intelligence agencies that if, if, if the document is more than 25 years old, it has to be released, and unless you've got a really good reason. And the, the, the onus was on them, and that if there was a question as to whether they should release it or not release it, it should be released. The, 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 the public should get the, the upper hand. So they, they disclose this, and what a lot of people don't know is that the Clinton administration declassified 800 million pages of files during their administration. So it, it's a, a, a situation, and the, the problem was that none of the UFO files came with it. There's a lot of stuff, and Clinton, uh, one of the stories was that Clinton had tried to get it, and they hadn't got it, and one of the stories was that it was this, his psychological profile that he had, uh, he had evaded the Vietnam War. He'd been going to school in, in, uh, in uh, Great Britain, and that uh, he had, the first issue he had when he got into the White House was to uh, put gays in the military, which caused an insurrection in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and one of them actually spoke to him, you know, and said that he totally disagreed with this. So Clinton was seen as sort of a left-wing guy that you really couldn't trust him. And that was always the story that they wouldn't tell Clinton because he couldn't keep his mouth shut. And one of the things that Clinton did when these files were coming out is he actually did open his mouth about another incident. And that was the, the uh, 
uh, plutonium thing where they were putting uh, radioactive material in food and stuff like this. And this, this story sort of broke that the intelligence agencies had been doing this kind of stuff. So Clinton was the type of guy, he was very open. And even now, uh, when people ask Bill Clinton a question about UFOs, he doesn't walk away from it. Most presidents, most high-ranking people will slough the question off. Bill Clinton will actually talk about it. But if you listen very closely to him, uh, you get the idea that he's still really not telling the truth. For example, when he was in Hong Kong, part of the answer to his question was, the guy said, when he answered the question, the guy came back and said, well, is there a list or isn't there a list? And he said, well, you, you know, uh, if, if there was, I'm probably not the first president they lied to or that bureaucrats have waited out. And he said, if there is some bureaucrat holding these files somewhere, they, if, they, if they evaded me, and I'm almost embarrassed to say I tried to get to the bottom of it. So Clinton is an interesting guy. And I think if, you, if somebody uh, respectable were to get Clinton and to actually confront him and do a half hour interview, I think you'd get a lot of material because Bill is pretty open. Even uh, Larry King had, had stated, and this is 1994, and we haven't found out what the answer to it was. Uh, Larry King had a UFO sighting in 1972. He was working for the, for the uh, Minnesota, or the Miami Dolphins had had a UFO sighting and he had been at Roswell in 1994 and uh, or at Area 51 he was and they were doing a show on Area 51. He'd done an interview with MUFON and in that interview he had said, he told about his sighting and then he also said that I'm friends with Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton doesn't like secrecy and I'm going to ask Bill Clinton. But we've never been able to get to Larry King to ask him, did you ask Clinton and what did Clinton tell you? So uh, it's, it's a very interesting presidency, and he's one of the guys that tried to get to the bottom and wasn't able to. The other one that tried to get to the bottom of the whole thing and wasn't able to was Jimmy Carter. Now, as you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, his involvement came from the fact that he had a UFO sighting. And the date given was 1969, but I've talked to an archivist at the uh, Carter Library who went to school with Jimmy Carter's son, and he said it was earlier. He said he, his, his, his son had told him the story, and he was sure it was earlier. Anyway, because he had this interest in, in he had had this sighting, in 1970, 1973, he actually filed a UFO uh, form where he detailed what had happened, signed the form, and it went, uh, I can't remember, it was a group out of uh, Oklahoma that he filed with. So when it comes to him being president, he's running for president, and on two different occasions, he talks about the fact that if he becomes president, he will release the UFO files. And so once he gets into the White House, and I went through his files, and a lot of people have been through his files to try to detail this, there are a number of initiatives that he does. For example, most people may not realize the, the FOIA uh, material that we have, the uh, UFO material, almost all of the material that we have was re released under the Carter administration. The FBI files, the CIA files, the uh, defense intelligence files, thousands and thousands of pages of files were released. And Jimmy Carter had the same sort of uh, uh, stance as Bill Clinton, that if, 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 the, if there was a toss-up as to whether to release it, it should be released. So a lot of this material was released under him, and he sent a bunch of people to try to figure out what was going on. His press secretary, who was Jody Powell, uh, went to the FBI and tried to find out from the FBI, how do you file UFO sightings, what do you have, all this sort of stuff. And the other one he had, he went to NASA. And Frank Press, I think was the, uh, uh, the science advisor, had gone to NASA and they wanted a new uh, investigation. They wanted NASA to take up a new investigation of UFOs, the same as Blue Book had done. And of course, what had happened, some of the background was that, that Carter had come in and he'd done some things he probably shouldn't have done. And one was he cut, I think, $5 billion from the NASA budget. So in one hand, he's cutting their budget. and the other hand, he's giving them this PR nightmare to take on the UFO thing. And NASA was very hesitant, but there's a lot of correspondence going back and forth about whether they were going to do this study. And then there was a document, a, a, a letter, a letter or whatever it was, came from the CIA to NASA which basically said, do not touch it. Said, don't touch it. And then they, they called it off and went back to the president and said, no, NASA doesn't want to do the study. But Jimmy Carter had his problem, I think, was that he came in and like Bill Clinton, he wasn't really interested in uh, intelligence. And he fired a bunch of CIA people. 
and uh, he was in a situation where he really wasn't trusted. And I think it's almost like Bill Clinton, there was a sort of a, a group that was always trying to get him out. And I even heard this when I went to the, to the library, to the Carter Library. They told me the story that when Carter went in, and the same thing happened to Bill Clinton, they came from the South. And they ran as outsiders in Washington. So Jimmy Carter, for example, wore short sleeves when he was campaigning, which presidents never did. You always had your suit on. He'd take a suit off. He'd have short sleeves. He wanted to be the outside guy. He'd take his tie off. I'm one of you. I'm not a Washington insider, the same as Clinton had done. And so the problem was, and I've always said, if you're a Washington outsider and you win the election, don't be surprised if you go to Washington and you find out that the people who have the power, the money, and the knowledge don't talk to you. And that's what happened to, to, to uh, Carter. And even the archivist told me that there was a lot of comments. It was sort of like, who does this guy think he is? These people walk around in bare feet and eat with their hands, referring to people that come from Georgia. And this, this guy's the president. And so there was this backlash. Plus, they would bring all their people in from, from Georgia in terms of Carter. And Clinton brought all his people in from Arkansas. So, and, and these Washington insiders really didn't like it. In fact, you, rem you probably recall uh, when Bill got into a lot of trouble with the Monica Lewinsky thing, Hillary Clinton was walking around talking about the vast right-wing conspiracy that was trying to get rid of her pres uh, the president. And I remember at the time I sort of laughed about it. And then after I'm thinking, maybe she had something. Maybe she was talking about this inside group, these powerful people who were actually try sabotaging the president on every initiative. So Carter had the problem the same as, as Bill Clinton, that he was a Washington outsider and he really couldn't get to the bottom of the thing. And there was there's a number of stories about a briefing that he was that he was given. There was a uh, it was it a Secret Service agent. I think it was a Secret Service agent. There was a, a a researcher who had been told the story by the Secret Service agent that Jimmy Carter had been briefed and that Jimmy Carter was totally broken up by what by, by what he had heard in the briefing, and uh, that uh, even one part that he had been crying. And uh, so I, I heard the tape. And but this guy is still around, and he was actually appointed by Bush as a top uh, person going into Iraq. So he was still a guy that was pretty powerful. They went back to him and he denied the story. He said, no, he told stories about things that had happened, and, but no, I don't, no, that didn't happen. I wasn't in this briefing with Jimmy Carter. So it's always been very hard because the records have always been kept very secret as to which presidents have been briefed and which presidents haven't. The only thing I know for sure, I've, I can guess at a lot of stuff that Truman knew and that, that Eisenhower knew. The only thing I know, and, and, and I still haven't released the, the name of the guy, but I had a close friend who talked to me until I talked about this. And uh, he said, can't keep your damn mouth shut. And I said, well, you know, like, you know, whatever, because it was supposed to be confidential, but people do in ufology, they'll send you stuff and then tell you not to, to keep it quiet. But it was an important thing, and that was that he had talked to two presidents. And he was, had come to me looking for Jimmy Carter's phone number. And he had already talked, and he was tracking. One of the big stories I've always tracked is the Holloman Air Force Base film. And the rumored story was, and this was part of the story that had been told about Jimmy Carter by this Secret Service agent, was that part of the briefing for Jimmy Carter was a 15-minute was a color film of the Holloman Air Force Base landing. And it was very important, and it seemed to back up the fact that this guy was telling the truth, even though he denied it later, because this friend of mine had told me that he was looking for Jimmy Carter's phone number. He'd already talked to uh, uh, Ford, and he'd talked to uh, Bush Sr. And they had both confirmed to him, he'd asked them about briefings, and they'd both confirmed to him that they'd seen the Holloman Air Force Base film. And the Holloman Air Force Base film is a story that Bob Ammenegger, and I know Bob Ammenegger very well, I've talked to him, been with him numerous times, heard the story 20 times, is a story that happened in the Nixon administration where they were green-lighted a study, and they were basically given access to everybody. Everybody talked, all the Blue Book people talked, and they were given a film, and they had it in their possession. They had this film, and it, it purported to be a landing. There was three crafts had come in. The, the, uh, the, the film cameras were all set up at Holloman Air Force Base. They knew these things were coming in, and the, the, the one came down, the other two stayed up, and it landed on the tarmac, and a bunch of high-ranking officials came. These aliens came out of the, the spacecraft. This is all being filmed. And then they walked down the tarmac to a building on Mars Avenue at Holloman Air Force Base, and they, they had a meeting or whatever they did there. And so Bob Ammenegger had this film, and uh, the, these two presidents claimed to have seen this film. And this is what this fellow was actually researching. 
So he asked, um, for example, he asked uh, Ford, and that's the key thing is the briefing. He asked Ford, he said, well, when were you briefed? And Ford says, I'm not going to tell you. Don't even go there. I'm not telling you where I was briefed. And that's the whole thing is if you give the briefing date, then you've got something to work with. Then you know what room they're in because the presidential record is all there. And you can tell who is in the room. You know who the people to press. And you can force the briefing out. But un until you know when the briefing is. So it's always been hard to determine who got briefed and, and who didn't get briefed. Now, when it comes to uh, Barack Obama, Barack Obama has faced the UFO question on three different occasions. And uh, the first occasion that Barack Obama faced the question was uh, after one of Stephen Bassett's X-Files conferences. The Washington Post uh, went to all the different campaigns when Barack Obama was campaigning and asked them, are you going to end the, U the ET embargo on information? And uh, Obama's spokesman said, we're more interested in ending the, the uh, embargo on information coming out of Iraq. That was the first time. The second time was in October of 2007, Barack Obama was at a, uh, a, a uh, debate in Philadelphia. This is the famous one where uh, Kucinich is asked the UFO question, and Kucinich confirms that yes, he did see a UFO at Shirley MacLaine's house, and it was a UFO, what's the big deal? The very next question, they go from him, from the, asking the question of Kucinich to Obama and asking the question that all the astronauts of Apollo 11 all uh, have uh, said that they believe there's life outside of Earth, what's your position? And Barack Obama says, uh, I really don't know and I don't pretend to know. What I do know is there's life here on Earth and we're not taking care of it. And then he goes into the whole speech about the people that have to be taken care of. So he avoids the question. Then he's asked, and we believe, we haven't tracked it down, we have the video, but we believe it's a Chicago uh, reporter asks him the question, says, Mr. Bur Mr. Obama, if you get to the White House and you discover that there are ETs and the people haven't been told, will you tell the people? And he says, well, it depends what the aliens are like, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. So he basically evaded it. And then I guess there's one other story. Uh, a lot of people, Stephen Bassett had done a campaign to send letters to the... Uh, to the White House and a lot of different issues and, and Barack Obama put up this change.gov site where people were asked questions and stuff. So there's a lot of people asking UFO questions and they now have a, a website, the, the White House has a website where people can give their opinion and what they want and uh, so a lot of people are asking UFO questions. Now the woman that's running the, the website is uh, Becky, I can't remember her last name, but is running the site and she actually does describe the fact that uh, people who are asking UFO questions or other questions can talk among each other, which kind of amazed me. It's like the reason we're putting on it here is for you to read. We talk among each other all the time. You know, we don't need to talk among each other. And the one thing that she said was, was very discouraging because the two big issues that, were, that have been brought up, people asking questions are the legalization of marijuana and the other one is where's Barack Obama's birth certificate. So this woman, she, and she's out of the White House, said, uh, the, the most popular issues aren't p potentially the most important, which basically says even if UFO people write millions of letters and it gets there, just because you have the most number of requests doesn't mean it's an important issue and we're going to answer it. So that's where it goes. Barack Obama is kind of a, uh, a guy who's more interested in other stuff. There's the very interesting connection with John Podesta, who was the X-Files guy in the uh, Clinton White House. And I know from, from people who know, who've talked to John Podesta and, sh and the main one being Leslie Kane, who says that she does not believe that John Podesta has brought it up and will not bring up the issue, that they've got other things to do. And so it sort of dies there that you think, well, they're, it's not an issue that they're really going to look at. This comes to how I became involved in the president. I, I saw uh, a number of UFOs. I was involved in a flap of UFO sightings in Carmen, Manitoba, Canada in 1975, two weeks after the end of the Vietnam War. I had my first sighting. This was near missile silos in North Dakota, the Minuteman three missile silos. And I had believed that the missile silos had been on alert because of the Vietnam War and the UFOs suddenly appeared. Because I'd asked people in a town, like, why are they coming to our little town in Canada? It was in the middle of nowhere. 
And I'd had a number of sightings, and what I did was I wrote a manuscript called Tales of Charlie Red Star. And I'd put it out, and really the publishers, some of them read it, and I remember the local publisher who should have done it, because it was a big story where I came from, said, you may believe in this kind of stuff, count me among the unbelievers. And that was my rejection letter to my manuscript. So I had the manuscript and I said, well, this, this is something that I, I gotta get, you know, I, I've seen it, I know what it is, and this is the, 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 the sort of the, um, the title of James Fox's new movie, I know what I saw. And I've told people that 150 times over the last 35 years, I know what I saw. Don't argue with me about UFOs. I know what I saw. I was I was 50 feet away at one point of, of one of these objects. But anyway, so I, I knew what I saw, and I knew that it was probably extraterrestrial, that this was something. My father's a pilot. My son's a pilot. I'm not stupid. I know what I saw, and I wanted to get an answer to this thing. So when I got all these rejections on the manuscript, and everybody just sort of listened to my sightings and said, oh, it's kind of interesting, so what else is new? I decided to go after the Canadian government, and I went after the work of Wilbert B. Smith, who had run the Canadian government program from 1950 to 1954. I talked to him, I pulled all the documents from, and he had hidden the documents away. When, when, before he died, he told his wife, hide the files, the government's coming. And the Russians came, the Americans came, and the Canadians came, all trying to get the documents, started breaking into the house. I recovered the documents, I found out where they were, filed the documents, and we came up with the, the famous document that David Rudy, I could talk to you about top secret document UFOs or flying saucers. He never used the word UFOs. He knew it was a, a term used, developed by the U.S. Air Force to throw people off. He always called them flying saucers. Flying saucers exist. It's uh, two points higher than the hydrogen bomb in classification. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. And there's a group headed by Vannevar Bush who's looking into it. And I went there and I found out that he was a contactee, that he actually claimed to be talking to them. He, we went through all this stuff. There was a bunch of other people that were involved in contacting them, uh, and particularly a woman in Maine who had been contacted by the FBI, Navy Intelligence, uh, uh, Air Force, White House, uh, the same woman that he was using, and they all had contact with the alien by the name of Alpha. So anyway, I, I filed all that material, put it all sort of away, and it was very fascinating. A lot of people were very fascinated to find out the Canadian government was really into this and actually believed that this was going on and that the guy in charge of it was, was actually claimed to be talking to them. And that material led to uh, um, his correspondence, his, his meeting at the, at the um, Canadian Embassy in Washington where he got all this material. And the guy he got it from was Dr. Robert Sarbacher, who was a, uh, a sort of a military advisor to the Pentagon. And uh, later, years later, Stanton Friedman went back and found out this guy was still alive. This is in 1982, 1983. So Stanton talked to, to uh, Saarbacher and said, did you give this material to Wilbur Smith? And Saarbacher says, yeah, I recall giving it to him. And, and so he said, well, why was it classified? I have no idea. He said, I have no idea why they classified it so high. And he said, well, how did you know about this? He said, well, there was a series of briefings at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Something had crashed in the West, and we, a bunch of scientists, and I was invited to go out there to briefings that they were giving to the, the top military people, or the scientists. They were basically scientists and engineers. And so Stanton says, well, name the guys who, who, who went. Uh, you didn't go because he, he said he had been busy up in Canada working on the Dewline uh, radar, and he couldn't go, but he said, well, who went? Who went? And he would name off uh, Vannevar, Vannevar Bush, and he said, well, he's dead, and Bronk, and he would name all these different people, and Stanton says, well, can you name anybody who's still alive? And he says, well, there's this one guy from Pennsylvania. I don't remember his name, but he's real arrogant. He thought he knew everything. And a bunch of research was done, and it came up with the doc name of Dr. Eric Walker. Now, this material I, it was my second book, which was published, the first book that MUFON published. And it didn't go anywhere because MUFON, it was an in internal book. You couldn't buy it on the street. So MUFON published 1,000 copies. 1,000 copies were sold. It really didn't go anywhere. And what it basically is, is the, this guy, we tracked him down, and his name was Dr. Eric Walker. He was former president of Penn State University, the Ivy League Engineering College at State College, Pennsylvania. He'd been president there for 17 years. The president before him, who had, appoint, had given him the job as president, was Milton Eisenhower, who was the pre president's brother, who went, left State College or Penn State to go and work for the president, to advise the president, and Walker took over. And Walker knew everything. And based, he was the type of guy that when we phoned him, couldn't hang up the phone. So what we would do is, there was a bunch of researchers, I was sort of head of a team of researchers who contacted Walker from all over the world. And everybody would say, I can get him to talk. And that wasn't my thing. So I, I, okay, fine. And I would get all the transcripts of people talking to him and send him letters and stuff. And Walker was the type of guy who wanted to sort of play with the subject. He didn't want to talk to you about it. And he couldn't hang up the phone. People get him on the phone and he would try to talk around it. But he, when you put all these transcripts and all these letters together, you could actually 
determine what he was talking about. And a lot of times he did confirm. For example, we asked him about MJ-12, and he confirmed, yes, I've known of them for 40 years. Look, you're up against the windmills. Leave it alone. There's nothing you can do about it. And that was like days after the MJ-12 document came out. He basically confirmed, I've known of them for 40 years. That was 1987, and you take it back, it's 1947. So we, we put all this material in a book, and uh, Walker um, was contacted by a reporter. We figured this was going to break the cover-up because it was so dramatic, this material, and this was such a highly respected guy. He had been actually an assistant secretary of defense at one point in the United States. So the reporter went, and for the first time, Walker hung up the phone. He said, I deny it, Didn't ha I, 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 it's not true, and sorry, I'm busy, and hung up the phone. So I said to my co-author, who was a, a journalist there, I said, well, is she going back? What's going to happen? He said, no, she's not going back. And that was it. Nobody ever interviewed him again, and the story sort of died. So what happened then was I was looking for his files. From He was, he was the uh, assistant, the executive secretary of the Research and Development Board, which David Ridiak had been talking about. This is this top-level uh, group that developed weapons in the United States, and he was the executive director. So when the director wasn't there, he was the head guy on developing weapons at the Pentagon. He was at the E-ring. He was in the major part of the, uh, the main part of the Pentagon. And he had promised those files to the Truman Library. So that's how I got into the presidential thing. I was going after Walker's files. So I went to the Truman Library, and they didn't have the files. And so while I was there, I said, well, what have you got on UFOs? And they said, well, we've got a couple of documents, and they named a couple of pages, whatever. And I thought, this is kind of strange. You know, this is uh, pretty important stuff. And about maybe 150 miles down the road is the Eisenhower Library in Kansas. So I was down there, and I'm a long way from anything. So I decided to go to the Eisenhower Library. And I went to the Eisenhower Library, and you actually have to do an interview to, to research there. So the, they were doing the interview with me about what you're going to research, whatever, and uh, so went into UFOs, and they pulled the files, and there was five documents. It's 30, 30 million pages of files and five documents. And at that point, I said, this is the most important subject in the world. This is the most powerful guy in the world. The two have to go together. There has to be a connection. And I started at that point saying, what is the president, what is the most important powerful guy in the world know about the most important subject. And that's what led me going from library to library to library. And what I basically found in a lot of cases is there's really nothing there, which either means nothing happened or the president didn't know or they're able to keep the, the, the file secret. They're there, but they're keeping it secret, which I don't think is one of the possibilities. Because over the years as I've been to the presidential library, I've gotten to know a number of the archivists, and I don't think the archivists are covering the thing up. Because, for example, the one guy at the Carter Library had heard the Jimmy Carter story in 1967. It was extremely interesting. We sat, we sat in the archives two hours after the archives closed, talking about UFOs. So these people were very interested, and he would actually send me material that I hadn't even requested. He'd say, I found this, and he would send it to me. But the thing was that there's very little in the, in the, in the, the libraries which leads to the question that Bill Clinton, I'm probably not the first president to lie to or that bureaucrats have tried to keep in the dark, which leads to the thing, is there a second government? One of, one of the main stories that, that's very interesting about the, the inner government is a story that Stephen Greer says that Sarah McLennan told him. And Sarah McLennan was a longtime White House reporter from the 1940s on. And she was, took Steve, Steve Bassett's, or not Steve Bassett, but Stephen Greer. She was uh, close with him. She was trying to help him. And so she went to the president. She went to Clinton. She said, why don't you do what these people are asking? Why don't you disclose what, what's going on? And Sarah, and, and according to Sarah McClendon, Bill Clinton leaned over and said, Sarah, there's a government inside the government, and I don't control it. And that sort of fits in with what Hillary Clinton was saying. There's a vast right-wing conspiracy that's trying to get rid, that's giving Bill problems with all this, these scandals, and that's what's behind it. So th there is this issue, and it, it is sort of supported in presidential files that either nothing happened or the president doesn't know what's going on. Because uh, in the presidential library, not only do you have millions of pages of files, you also have the more important thing is the oral histories. And oral histories is things, something like what you're doing. They have a, a guy that's going to film or tape. Anybody leaves the White House, you're the cook in the White House. Okay, what was it like to be the cook in the White House? Did you ever meet the president? Do you ever have, you know, and go through this sort of stuff. And these people would just talk off the record about what it was like to work in the White House, what it was like to be Secretary of Defense, oh, did they have these, what, this major event that happened to you, what was the inside story, and they would talk. And for example, at the Lyndon Johnson Library, there's a thousand oral histories. And some of these, for example, at the Truman Library, you can actually word search them. 
and there's no discussion of UFOs. So you can cover up the records, you can cover up the documents, but can you cover up people in just open talk, talking about this kind of stuff? Because there is one, and that was Truman's uh, air aide, the guy who was sort of the head of Air Force One before they called it Air Force One. It was his, his aide to, to the Air Force. Uh, was brought in, and he tells a story that he had seen UFOs. Uh, he was at the 8th, 8th Air Force in Hawaii during World War II, and that they had had these uh, Foo Fighter, like things appearing on radar that they had seen. And he talks about when he got to the White House, he was called into the White House by Truman, and Truman says, I want you to go to the CIA, and I want you to gather all the stuff from the CIA, and I want you to brief me orally, not in writing, but orally, on uh, what's going on with this flying saucer thing. And according to Landry, General Landry, he said he briefed the president every three months. And we figured out from 48, February of 48, when he took over to the end, he probably had 16, 17 briefings on, on UFOs. But Landry talks openly about it, so why wouldn't people in the Clinton administration or the uh, Johnson administration talk about, oh, uh, you know, Johnson was interested in UFOs and this happened, that happened, and it doesn't. Which means it, it really, unless they're very secretive, it really didn't get talked about. It's not an issue. And that's the problem with this situation with Barack Obama. They're so busy, people don't realize how busy the president is. He's up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and it's like photo op. And then it's make these phone calls to push for a bill, to get this across. And then you've got a, you've got a cabinet meeting, and then you've got this, and then you've got that. And it's like, it's minute by minute, the presidential record that they go through. They haven't got time, and this is why the briefing is so important. They don't have time to read anything. They're briefed by people. Someone will come in and they know there's a question coming on a certain subject. They'll go and give a 15-minute briefing to bring the president up to speak because he hasn't got time to do anything. So it's it's a very sort of uh, interesting place to to research, to see, and to see that uh, that the records are important if we get, if we get a lead. For example, I uh, the, the famous story that I talked to Dick Cheney, that was in the Bush uh, Bush administration where they had claimed that they were going to release the UFO files. Charles Huffer, who was a researcher, had been told by Bush on a number of occasions, yes, I'm going to release the UFO files. Here's Dick Cheney. He's Secretary of Defense. He knows. He, he's, he's a smart guy. And then he said it'll be the first thing Cheney does when he gets to the White House. So, of course, when he got to the White House, nothing happened. Then a couple months later, he was on the Diana Reem show, a Washington talk show that sometimes has high-ranking people. Hillary Clinton's been on there. Uh, all these people have been on there, and I decided I'm going to phone in. And I actually got on, I was the first caller on, and I said, Mr. Cheney, in all your jobs in government, have you ever been briefed on the subject of UFOs? And if so, when was it, and what were you told? And there was sort of a pause, and Cheney said, if I'd been briefed on that subject, it would probably be classified, and I wouldn't be talking about it. And he'd been caught off guard because nobody ever asked him the question. And so what happened was then Diana Reem came, but by then he'd sort of caught his footing. She said, well, Mr. Vice President, have you had any UFO meetings since you got to the White House? And he said, no, I've had no UFO meetings since I got to the White House. So he'd sort of caught himself. And in the end, then he got a bunch of Halliburton questions, and he was furious at the end of the interview. He said, well, you got some real wild callers today. He was, he was not happy about what he had gotten. And I don't think he really appeared on a talk show for years after that. He was so upset. And that, to me, is the, the critical thing, is if a person gets a high-ranking official whether it's a four-star general like David Rudiak talked to, or whether it's a vice president or a president, you don't want to ask them, what do you think about UFOs? You don't want to ask them, uh, you know, did they see a UFO? You only want to ask them one question. Were you briefed? When were you briefed? And what were you told? Because the briefing is the official thing that we're all looking for. If you're the president of the United States, the most powerful guy, if they, they know there's a question on, on UFOs coming, they're going to sit the president down and they're going to say, they're going to bring in the top intelligence people, they're going to gather all the best information they have on the subject. They're going to bring that people into the room, that guy into the room, and he's going to say, Mr. President, here's what we know about UFOs. And that's what you want. That's the only truth. The rest is all disinformation. What you want is what they're telling the president, unless they're lying to the president, which is another possibility. Speaking of Paul Hellyer, there's a very interesting story, and this ties in with the, the Wilbur Smith research. And this is, uh, we knew about Paul Hellyer years ago. We were bugging him about UFOs long before he became public. And the two people that were bugging him was Arthur Bray. He was a researcher in Ottawa, Canada, and he was the guy who got control of the Smith files. The, they were trying to hide the Smith files, and they gave it to him. 
And he was a guy who had a Navy, he was a Navy guy, had a security clearance. So some of the stuff that was in the files, he had already seen the top secret memo before it was declassified because Smith had double copied it and it was in the files. So he knew about this. And anyway, Arthur Bray and I were after a story that happened in 1967. Canada in 1967 was the 100th anniversary of the, uh, the country. So they had a bunch of centennial projects all over the country. And one of the projects that they had was in St. Paul, Alberta, which is just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. They built a UFO landing base, a little tourist thing outside, you know, maybe 100 feet across and for the tourists to come. And they built this landing base. Now, Paul Hale at the time was Secretary of Defense in Canada. So he goes to this landing base to open the landing base. And he's making his speech and he, he gives the speech and he says, you know, this is not the first time we've had a landing base. The Canadians opened up uh, a top secret base uh, in 1954 for UFOs to land and nothing landed, therefore UFOs don't exist. So that's fine. And it was across the, the headlines or whatever. I didn't see the story till the 1970s and suddenly I saw this story when I was working on the Wilbur Smith thing because I really didn't get involved till 1975. I had no interest in UFOs whatsoever. Never even thought about UFOs before then. And so when, the, when I saw this story, uh, we started trying to contact Pella Hellier. And we weren't really interested in, in, in much except, where did this story come from? And about this landing base that they had built. So when I went and I interviewed uh, uh, Wilbur Smith's wife, and she, this is about a week before she retired. She was very upset in the Canadian government because there was a, we have the French-English problem. And she was English, and the French were starting to take over the government. They were, you had to be able to speak both languages. And she was very upset about a lot of things in the government. So she was ready to talk. And she told me the, all these different stories about Wilbur and about the, what was going on and, and what, just stuff that would just blow you away. So I, and one of the stories, so then I gave her the newspaper heading from my 1967 from the Winnipeg Free Press, and I showed her this story. And it said, UFO base opened whatever it was for UFOs to land. And I said, I handed it to her and I said, did Wilbur have anything to do with this? So she sat there and she read the story and she said, yeah, that was Wilbur. And I said, so what happened? She says, well, Wilbur went to the Prime Minister of Canada and he went to the RCMP, which is the Federal Police Force, and he went to the Secretary of the uh, Defense Department. And he said, and Wilbur openly in his speeches talks about this, we got to quit trying to shoot these things down. And if we would shoot them down, we would, you know, we could have contact with them. And so he'd gone to these three different people and he'd said, if you don't shoot down the UFO, I will get AFA, which is the name of the alien, to land. So they went into a meeting and they said, uh, and, and, and you can't do anything to them. So they, they went into this meeting and the three people agreed, yes, they would allow him to land without shooting him down. So then Wilbur said they wanted a guarantee that once whoever was going to talk to him, and that the base was Suffield, Alberta, which is the Area 51 of Canada. They'd done, a, it's got a restricted fly zone over it. It's a highly top secret base in Alberta. And so um, the, Wilbur wanted to guarantee that when the UFO landed at Su Suffield, that it would, they would talk to it, do whatever they wanted, and then it would be allowed to take off. And they went back, and I can't remember exactly which one of the three agencies didn't agree that they would, they would go along with that, that they would necessarily let the thing take off again. And so Wilbur says, okay, that's it. We're calling it off. No, nobody's going to land. So the whole story was told that it's true. Hellier had this story from somewhere. So we went after Hellier and we said, so where'd the story come from? Where'd you get the story? Because we knew the, the inside story of what had happened. And Hellier said, well, there was an expert inside the Department of Defense that told me the story, but I can't remember the guy's name. And I think this is maybe what got me in trouble with Hellier. And I went, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, how can you not remember the top official in your department? And he said there was a file. The guy had the file. So when, when Hellier retired, he said that he was going to go to the archives in, in Ottawa and he was going to try to find this, this file. And then he came back and said, no, he couldn't, he couldn't find the file. It, it wasn't there or whatever. But Bray and I, for years, were writing letters to Hellier, trying to get him to, who was the guy who told you the story? Where'd you get it? So it, this goes back to last year at the X conference, uh, and I, I guess I put on my website that you know I, how can you believe this story that Hellier didn't remember who this this was? So I remember Hellier, and he's a big guy. You've met him. He's a fairly impressive, large guy. He wanted to have breakfast. So I said, okay, fine. So we would come down. He's got these files under his arm, and uh, so he says to me, you know, Mr. Cameron, I may mean many things, but one of them is I'm not a liar. And I went, oh, 
And I'm merely thinking, like, what the heck did I write, you know? So we sat down, and he plops these files open to me, and they're from 1967, and they're from the National Research Council and stuff. And, and I said, wow, this is 67. I mean, we've got all this stuff. This is, uh, you know, this is nothing unusual. I mean, it's, it's not the stuff. The thing I was interested in was your, your, your speech in 1967, where you talked about the fact they'd opened the UFO base to land. And we've got the other side of the story, and we wanted to know who the official was and what this is all about. And he says, I don't even remember giving the speech. I, it was written for me by somebody. I don't remember giving the speech. And after that conversation with Hellier, and we had breakfast for maybe 25 minutes, I was thoroughly convinced that he was absolutely telling the truth, that he really didn't remember, that he really didn't have any knowledge. And that's one of the things about Hellier, that he really didn't have any knowledge. There was maybe stuff coming across his desk, UFO sightings or whatever, but it was something that he just pushed aside. So here's a Secretary of Defense who really is out of the loop as well in Canada. And the stuff is going somewhere, but he, here's a guy who had the chance, and if he had the interest he had now, he would have got something done. But at that time, he really didn't have any interest. But it was very impressive to have this vision that some government official is covering up, and then to actually sit down with that government official for half an hour and go, I was wrong. The guy really doesn't remember, does, didn't really know. If you, if you need any more information, you can get uh, most of the material that I talk about about the presidents. And what I do is I just basically tell the presidential stories. I don't really, sometimes I'll put my opinion in, but mostly it's like the stories are there. And when it's all said and done, we'll weed it out. We'll try to edit it. But I try to put as much material, anything that's relevant. For example, on Barack Obama, there's probably got to be 200 different stories about secrecy, about his interest in space, about his UFO stuff. Just trying to put it all down there so that another researcher can come along and get it.